Don't laugh, Alex. He's seen me playing football. I was a sportsman. <laughs> and I used to play football. I still run about, about chasing the young lads, but I don't think I'm really allowed to do that. I think at some point they should tell me, John, stop chasing us. You're never going to catch us. You're too slow. But, you know, in sports... You start off and you're a bit rubbish, aren't you? Fair to say? You're play, trying to play ping pong and you can't hit the ping or the pong, whichever one it is. What is it, the ping and the pong? I don't know. You're trying to play badminton and you can't hit the shuttlecock. And you think, I want to do better, don't you? Darren's an ex-cricketer. Ex-cricketer. But he still could play cricket. If we gave him a bat and a ball, he could still play. But I know that there was a time when Darren really worked really hard on his sports. I know that James used to play rugby. He just tries hard, don't you, James? But you know, I see these lads, the young lads, and they just want to get better. They want to improve. They want to get stronger. They want to get faster. They want to get fitter. They want to achieve to a higher level. And they want things to just go so well in their sporting career well as a Christian I believe that we all want to push further and you know what's great about a Christian is that yeah my football career is starting to, to plateau and it's starting to go over the other side and I'm realizing a few things I'm not really going to get any faster I'm not really going to get a huge amount fitter and I'm not really going to get a lot slimmer. It's just the way it is. But you know, as a Christian, you can build and build and build. And you can grow and you can grow and you can grow. And you can develop and you can... You, you, it, it's, just, it's just all out there. And we have a God that wants to connect in with us. And grow us and enable us and equip us. And what Julian said was amazing. That there's a gift and there's a talent in every single one of us. And some of you will see it and you'll know about it. And you'll see it developing and flourishing. And you'll go, yes. And I'd love you to have met me perhaps about 20 odd years ago. Because I wasn't like this. I was much worse. I do evangelism everywhere and anywhere against anyone. I was desperate that God would know, that people would know God and they would, in, they would have a deeper faith and they'd have a deeper hunger. And why we're doing 40 days of prayer is that we've identified something amazing is that the ministry of Jesus and the disciples, the apostles and the early church was based in prayer. Do you know Jesus didn't say to the uh, to, the, to the disciples, I'm going to teach you to run a course. And it's going to cost you £200. And you've got to go on a day conference to Jerusalem. Because that's the place where you're going to get the, the teaching materials. And it's all going to go really well. Do you know what Jesus said to his disciples? Come follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. But he also encouraged them to do the things that he was doing. And 40 days of prayer is based on looking at the ministry of Jesus. Looking at the teachings of the Bible that will help you and enable you to go further. To jump higher. To go deeper. To know God more. And I believe that we're in a great, a great day in this church. That with the church building and Caldicott, and Wales, and further afield, are full of people now today that want to know God more. People don't just come to church to please the vicar, pastor, minister anymore. You come because you want to know God more. And I love it. The people that don't really want to come, don't really want to go deeper with God. Don't really want to know and experience more of what God wants. But you guys, young people... I don't know about the little babies. I think they have to come. But you guys, me and all of us that are here, we want to know God more. 
And I'm going to just shoot through this uh, leaflet. You don't have to look through it um, or hold it. You can if you want to. But it will help you with the sequence of where we're going to go. And it's uh, just seven very, very quick points. And then we're going to sing and pray with the band. Uh, the, the first part is that 40 days of prayer is a commitment. And I believe that today... We struggle with commitments. We struggle with endurance. Most of you will know that I'm a marathon runner. X. I know how you feel, Darren. I was a marathon runner. It's awful. Deb, what's it like running a long distance now? You love it, don't you? I hate running. I despise runners. I didn't even record the London Marathon. But you know what someone told me? They said the Christian life isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. Anyone fancy doing a marathon with me? <laughs> it's about endurance. It's about getting out of bed in the morning. It's about doing the things that you don't really want to do. It's about picking up the Bible and saying, I'm struggling to understand this, but I'm going to work harder. It's about coming out, doing stuff, sacrifice. And do you know what? We can come to church and say, yeah, I want it, John. Come on, give it me. And do you know the next day, we're not even interested. Consistency, longevity, 40 days. It's not a very long time, really. But to commit yourself to be part of this for 40 days, it's going to be hard. Do you know why it's going to be hard? Because you and I are both human. And sometimes we're at the top and sometimes we're down the bottom. The first thing I want us to think about is the tongue. You see, we pray all these things to God, don't we? We pray, very often we pray these things at God. But I've written down on here, and it might be on the sheet, I'm not quite sure, that our mouth is the overflow of our hearts. Our mouth is the overflow of our hearts. And one minute we're praising, one minute we're in church and we've got our arms up in the air, and the next minute... We're having a right go at someone. The next minute we're slagging someone off. The next minute we're gossiping. The next minute we're... You never guess what. One minute we praise. And the next minute. It doesn't ring true, does it? So you need to get your heart right. To start into 40 days of prayer. You need to get your heart right. And you can do that this morning. One of uh, my good friends, uh, every week when I hear him pray, he confesses to the Lord to get himself right. And I hope you do that as well as I do. We confess to the Lord the things that we haven't done that we should have done. What's in your heart this morning? I'll tell you what's in your heart will overflow out of your mouth. And if you're with someone for a long time, you can get away with it on a Sunday. You can smile at the vicar. Hi, vicar. How are you? (laughs) Get in the car. Go and do whatever you want. I don't know. I haven't got a clue, have I? But you know what? The ministry starts when you walk through those doors. What do you say? And I'm going to stretch it a little bit into modern technology. How do you text not just the tongue and I'm sure Jesus would have texted wouldn't he would he have texted Isaac would he have Facebooked would he have a Twitter account he'd have a lot of followers mind (laughs) I did Twitter once I ended up with about seven followers I thought this is awful how can I start a cult I want to go no I was only joking (laughs) I seven followers and I think four of them were from the church and I didn't want them to follow me so no that's I I don't know but I don't understand Twitter I think it's for, well, it's for twits, isn't it? <laughs> but be careful how, how we text. Text then. Text people in a positive way. When you're on Facebook, shh, make sure that your Facebook usage 
is how you would speak face to face to someone else. So number two, 40 days of prayer and fasting. It's going to take some commitments. I, I, I'm being challenged about fasting. Luke 4, um, if you've got your Bible handy, you can look at this. Luke 4, 1 and 2. I'm being challenged about fast. I'm being challenged about sacrifice. It's awful. Isn't it? All, isn't it? I, I, I want a comfortable life. I have a lovely wife. I've got some average sort of kids. I, I want a comfortable life. Sorry, those that don't know me, they are here. Um, they have to listen to dad preach. So they're all thinking, oh, when can I go to uni and leave home? <laughs> go, to a, go to a good church. But, I, I, you know, I'm looking forward to the snooker, world championships. I want a comfortable life. Go watch a bit of telly, eat a bit of food. Don't, don't we all want... And God's saying, John, I, I want you to sacrifice. I'm like, Me? I'm the pastor. You, congregation, you can sacrifice. But I can't. Ken Sanders, he can. He's an elder. Ron, he's an elder. Let them, but I'm the pastor. I, you know what? For God's sake, John, it's hard. I don't, you, you, you sort of think I'm joking, but it, I, I'm concerned. Sacrifice is hard, isn't it? Because once you start sacrificing some things... Where, where will it lead? You know, I might have to sell my Lamborghini. It's hard. We might even have to stop having heating in the house. Electric. My, my computer. My iPhone 4S. It's hard, isn't it? Let's be really serious about it. It, it, it. We're called to a to a a sacrificial life. When there are people in the world that can't eat, and most of us, to be fair, eat more than we should. I got in last night and I was eating Doritos at half past eleven at night. I blame my mother-in-law. She brought them over. <laughs> Luke 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the deserts and was led by the Spirit into the deserts, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. I love that. See, Jesus knew what it was to sacrifice. But it was still hard. It was still hard. But Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit. And he fasted and he prayed. And then the devil came near to him, didn't he? And the devil attacked him. But Jesus, because he was prepared, because he was full of the Holy Spirit, he was able to withstand the attack of Satan. You're, you're under attack, did you know that, if you're a Christian? Did anybody know that they're under attack? Do you know I'm not an army man, but when, when the war was going on, with all the soldiers asleep in their barracks, and sometimes I see a picture of the church of Jesus Christ. We're under attack, but we, we don't do anything about it. I've got to just encourage you, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And we're not to bow down before Satan. We can kick him up the backside and tell him to get lost. You can. Number three, the harvest is plentiful. I could preach for hours and hours and hours on this. There are 15,000 people that live in Caldecott and they need to know Jesus. Luke chapter 10, 
1 to 2. As we're in Luke, we'll just look at it quickly. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others, sent them two by two ahead of every, every, uh, to, ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Even Jesus struggled with this. We need more workers, but we need the right workers. And we need the, the workers to be right. And they need to be right with the Lord, and they need to be prepared, and they need to be ready for action. 15,000 people in Caldecott need to know Jesus. And that's what God's called me to do is to reach 15,000 people. And I used, to, I used to do this, and I used to run around like a fool. But God's brought me back, and he said, no, I don't want you to reach them, John. I want the church to reach the community. And I thought, because you give me a stipend, and I'm so grateful for that, that I had to reach 15,000 people. And I used to pray every day, Lord, how do I reach this 15,000 people? And I've spent years and years and years running around like a maniac, like a fool, like a nutter. And you've seen me. And you're going, what, the, what on earth, John, are you doing now? Where is he going now? It's like, where's Wally? What, what, what's he doing? What, where, where, what's that? And the church would go, what, what, what's John doing now? And it, it was like that for a long time. And I believe that where we are now is that God's saying, I, I'm going to raise up men and women of God. I'm going to raise up young people, men, adults, uh, wh women. Should we say women? Yeah, women. We're allowed to raise women. Yeah, women. Women are great. Are women good? Men are good, Julian, aren't they? Uh, by the way, it's, not, um, it's, it's a good place to breakfast. It's excellent. But women, if you want a breakfast, you have one as well. Fantastic. But the, jo the job and the role is of all of us. We can all do something. We can't all do everything, but we can all do something. Honouring your parents. I like this one. I put this one in specifically for my children. <laughs> and for Alex. <laughs> Honouring your parents. Jackie, da-da-da said, Jackie's my dear wife, who knows everything. <laughs> Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, is uh, one of the only commandments that has a blessing attached to it. And I'm sure most of you know that. And it talks about being blessed and having long life if you honor your parents. Families are a real nightmare, aren't they? Yes. Especially mine. But you know what? When family works, it's the best place you can be. It's the best place that you can be. When you're safe and secure in a family, with parents, with grandparents, with uncles, with cousins, it's the very, very best place that you can be. And our prayer on day four is for families, is for parents, is for children. <clears throat> And I, I'm going to pray specifically for parents on that day. That parents will, 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 will know more and more how it is to parents as a Christian. And that our homes will be Christian. That our TVs will be controlled. That our internet usage will be carefully monitored. That the whole thing of the home will be done in a caring, compassionate and loving way. And that our children, that our, the, the, the parents that live there will put others before themselves. And we'll just do one more thing in that home. We'll just do one more thing before they go out. Just think about someone else. Just offer someone a cup of tea. Just say, how are you this morning? How's your day been when they come in? Just the general courteous stuff of what, what naturally should happen 
in a home. Day number five, fear and discouragements. Do you feel encouraged? Or discouraged? Hebrews 3.13 says, Encourage each, each other daily, as long as it's called today. Joshua uh, chapter 1, and we haven't got enough time to look at this, but he was just about to go into the promised land. He was just about to lead God's people. And God says to him, uh, be, uh, be courageous and do not be terrified and do not be discouraged. I'm telling you that there are lots of people this morning that are suffering with discouragements. There's lots of people this morning that have tried things that have failed. Anybody here like that? Hello, here we are. Here I am. You've tried something and it's failed. You've gone through that experience. You've tried something and it's failed. So therefore you're a failure. That's not right. Tell the devil that that's not right. I am not a failure. Amen. I am not a failure. I have done stuff and it's gone wrong. I've done that. Hello, here we are. I'm the pastor. I'm not perfect. I've not done everything right. I've done stuff and it's gone wrong. Therefore, I failed. Therefore, I am a failure. No, Satan, that's not right. I'm not a failure. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of the King. And I can get up again. I can go again. And I can do something again tomorrow. Because yesterday I failed. It doesn't mean I'll fail tomorrow. Your relationships are all up the, up the spouts. That's not a good phrase. Your relationships are all up the spout. You don't know who you're with. You don't know who you love. You don't know who you're doing it with. You don't know whether you love the person you're with, the family that you've been given. Therefore, you're a failure. You are not a failure. You are not a failure. You're human. And when we come to Christ, we still don't do everything perfectly. Amen? Any Christians that have ever failed here this morning? I'm sure, well, I know, I know about that, Ken. Yeah, you haven't got to put it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you come to Christ in your broken state, and he makes you a little bit less broken. And there's a lot of stuff that we can say about it, but be encouraged that today is a new day. It's a new start. Yesterday is gone. You can't bring back yesterday. And you know, a lot of people sit there in their lives looking at yesterday. If only. It was my fault. If only. Do you know what Jesus does? Take my hand. Come forward with me. Don't look back. Come forward with me. Prayer for others to know Jesus. Oh man, what are we going to do? Jesus calls us to be fishermen and not hunters. There's been lots of different ways that people have used to encourage people to become Christians, fair to say, over the years. There's been lots of courses, lots of thoughts, lots of ideas. I'm going to encourage you to be fishermen. I know Darren is a current fisherman, not an ex-fisherman. Darren's going, I wish I hadn't come to church this morning. <laughs> <coughs> I'm going to sit behind him. <laughs> and I don't know much about fishing, but I do know that it's difficult. I do know that it takes time. I do know that you have to prepare the, the, the bait. Is that the right word? You have to, I like the thing that they do with the catapult. I've always wanted to do that. I'm not interested in fishing. You know where they get the catapult and they shoot the food into the water? Do you do that still, Darren? We use boats now. Oh, you use what? Bolts. Boats. Boats. Oh, boats. Excellent. They use boats. But I, use, I try that. But you know, there's so many different ways to catch fish, isn't there? We're not hunters. And do you know when, you, when you're a hunter, you get a big gun, you shoot the gun, you only got one shot, haven't you? As fishermen, you gently keep going. 
Last night at the, uh, at the choir hall, there was lots of gentle fishing going on in that evening. It was fantastic. Lots of people there that might not be Christians. Lots of people there that were. Lots of gentle fishing that was going on. I, I, I went out there in the deep water. I was just hanging out, chatting, arm on the bar, seeing who was about. I come here often. You know, a bit of chit-chat, isn't it? That's how life's done. Last one, show kindness and love. Fantastic. Do you know, I've written, written on my, uh, um, my piece of paper, my prayer for you and for me is that our love will be instinctive. Let's just think about that. That our love will be instinctive. A lot of Christians do stuff in a really forced way. And you can see they're loving someone, but it's not natural. You can see they're being kind to someone, but, but, but they're really, really uncomfortable. And they're, oh, oh no, I'm being kind to someone. Do you, do you want to cross the road or not? Do you, and it, it's really stressful being kind. And just, just be natural. Be instinctive. Let's be led by the spirits day after day. When you're in the post office, when you're in Waitrose, if you're in Waitrose, then you need to give a bit more in the offering. But if you're in Waitrose or if you're in Aldi or if you're queuing for a football match or it's raining or it's cold and your car's broken down, the AA man comes. Do you know the AA man comes and you're chatting with him? That's an opportunity. And you know, you might be in the hospital of the doctors, and we had a great time last year, didn't we, love? And we met loads of nurses, loads of doctors, and some of you are going through that season at the moment. But you know, every single day is an opportunity to show love and kindness. And you know what? It opens up into loads of wonderful conversations. Just by showing someone love and kindness. Well, I finished. I know Tino has finished because he's got a cloth on his head. <laughs> Look at him. I don't know if you can see. He's brilliant. <laughs> Do you know when you think that I should stop preaching, bring a cloth and just put it on your head. <laughs> and just like that. That's absolutely brilliant. Thanks, Mandy. That's great. <laughs>